so frustrated to be unwell this morning because what I have to share with you, despite appearances, I'm really excited about. And I'm hoping that the beauty and promise of what I'm going to outline for you will communicate God's enthusiasm for our life together and work in Christ better than your preacher's ministry and presence. So, this morning, I want to talk to you about being at peace. This phrase, being at peace, is going to be our focus for the coming program year. I always think it's strange when congregations don't live up to their reputation, when congregations don't live into the identity that God gives them through their name. In my mind, if we are a congregation that has been called by the Lord Jesus to be a congregation of peace, that means that this, your participation in this congregation's life should be a source of peace. And maybe that doesn't mean everything in your life is just hunky-dory and goes perfectly, but it does mean that God gifts us something through our participation in this community of faith, gathering around the Word of God rightly proclaimed and the sacraments rightly administered. Matt, let's make a deal. Every time I look back, you forward it. Some of you may not know or maybe you don't remember, but in my work as a congregational redeveloper, uh, I have come to subscribe to a model called Simple Church. There are a couple evangelical guys who happen to be social scientists, and a few years back, they did a great investigation of congregations that would be characterized by their members and their neighbors as being vibrant congregations. And that didn't have anything to do with size. You could have big congregations that felt spiritually in the doldrums, uh, and you could have tiny congregations that felt quite vibrant. You could also, of course, have vibrant congregations that are quite large and sort of quiet, fallen asleep congregations that are quite small. When these two cats investigated vibrant congregations of every size, they discovered that one of the things those congregations had in common was that those congregations were intentional about moving people from the experience of worship into some sort of experience of formation, continuing education in the way of Jesus. Uh, those of you who have been here a while have heard me say before, if the last time you learned something about your faith was when you were in confirmation, you are overdue for some continuing education, my friends. It's something that you have to hear over and over again uh, in order to grow in your faith as a follower of Jesus. Uh, but it doesn't just stop at a worship experience and an experience of being formed in the way of Jesus, for congregations of all sizes, an important part of a vibrant life is that you have the kind of relationships with people in the congregation so that you're not just talking about the sports teams or the weather. You're talking about what Jesus is up to in your life and in one another's lives. And that is a huge part of congregational vibrancy. I always criticize Lutheran and mainline Protestant churches because for the last half century, while the non-denom big box churches were recruiting people into small groups where they were having their personal faith refined by personal relationships with siblings in Christ, the mainline Protestants were recruiting people into committees. And I don't know if you've heard but committees are like Protestant purgatory. <laughs> it is the worst possible way you would want to structure the devotional life of a community of faith. 
these guys also found that if you were bringing folks into worship and into a continuing education in the way of Jesus and building authentic relationships that refine their faith and create the esprit de corps one needs for mission, then that should all lead to servanthood. Gets you to that question where if Peace Lutheran Church imploded and we just, all of this just fell into the ground and got paved over, would any of our neighbors notice or care? And if they wouldn't, then that's usually a good indication that we have some more work to do when it comes to servanthood in the church, through the church, and beyond the church. In the simple church model, for those of us who have a tendency to obsess about numbers, uh, the vibrancy that the simple church model tries to get at comes at numbers in a slightly different way. Instead of us obsessing about the fact that we no longer have 750 people a weekend across three services, instead the simple church model says, don't despair over what you have lost. Instead, remember to dance with whoever's showing up. And so when you look at the simple church model, the encouragement in that model is to help your people a certain, uh, I don't know, a critical mass of your people make sure that they are taking the next step in their faith formation adventure. So usually when you're thinking about that, if you think about worship being 100% of your participation any given weekend, you want to see about 50% of your people in continuing education experiences in the way of Jesus. You want to see about a quarter of your people moving into small group life. And uh, Bishop Steve, the former pastor of this congregation, I can remember when I was a baby pastor at Alleluia, he would always say, Ryan, you always want to make sure that on, at any given moment, 10% of the people in your congregation are involved in servanthood. You're tithing the body of Christ in service to the world around you. Last year, we tried an experiment called the gathering. And what we tried to do is try to create a semi-worshipful experience of God's word that instead of following the lectionary and the church's calendar, uh, this gathering would focus on topical sermon series over several weeks and would have a succession of series. And the hope was that the Holy Spirit and I could come up with something that would grab your attention enough that you would give the church one more hour on Sunday mornings. And in some ways, that was very successful. I think we probably had one of the best Sunday school, adult Sunday school experiences in the whole synod. That last year, we had between 60 and 80 people who were attending. They tended to be the exact same 60 to 80 people. Uh, so the, for those of you who were willing to listen to me for two hours on a Sunday morning last year, I bless you and thank you for your support and partnership in that. But when I look at that, that says that that's about 25% of our worship attendance participating in formation, which is, again, compared to many of our sister congregations, they would love to have 60 to 80 people showing up for adult Sunday school. But uh, you know me well enough by now to know that while I am grateful, I am never quite content. And so the council, the staff, and I took that to heart in our prayerful deliberations over the course of the summer as we started to imagine what this next year of programming might look like. And, uh, and we think we've come up with a tweak. Instead of trying to come up with things that seemed cool or interesting enough that I could actually lure you into a second hour of programming, we stepped back from that approach and asked ourselves, what does a person 
need to experience, to know, and to know how to do to be a vibrant follower of Jesus at peace. And you can read that last little preposition, at peace, however you like. You can, uh, if you wonder to yourself, uh, is Pastor Ryan interested in seeing us participating in the Congregation of Peace Lutheran Church on a more regular basis? Yes, Ryan is interested in that. But at the same time, Ryan is interested in seeing you be at peace. Some of you come to me as your world is falling apart, and I don't know if you expect me to give you financial advice or occupational advice or relationship advice, and sometimes I have enough life experience to be able to do that, but I also want you to appreciate that the only balm I have to offer you is Christianity. Like, that's my thing that I have to give you, and part of my job is to see to it that you are, that you are practicing that Christianity before the hard times hit, so that when they do, and they always do, your soul has something of the muscle memory you need to be able to weather those storms. So what does a person need to experience to know and to know how to do? Council continues to emphasize that our programming should result in biblical fluency. Uh, we should continue to receive theological formation. We continue to learn about peace's missional culture. Uh, all of those things are really important. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. Uh, Biblical fluency. So if, uh, if you think to yourself that God changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that God changed, that would be a sign to you that you are in need of greater biblical fluency because that is not true. Theological formation. Uh, if you have ever said to yourself, well, the Lord never gives you more than you can handle. It's a cute little piece of Hallmark card Christian wisdom. And maybe a sign that you are needful of better theological formation. Because that is not always true. Missional culture. If, uh, if someone shows up at Peace Lutheran Church and they don't look like we do, sound like we do, smell like we do, and you wonder to yourself, even in some small way, whether or not they really belong here, you really are needful of more formation in your missional culture. Uh, so all of those things continue to be an emphasis in our ministry. But council has added one more thing, and this, uh, this is a big pitch, that council understands that somehow God is calling us in this coming program year to be better at being Bible readers. Notice I didn't say Bible worshipers. We aren't that kind of Christian. If you want that kind of weird Christianity, where the Bible becomes your paper pope, you have to go to a different part of the Christian family. In this part of the Christian family, we don't interact with Scripture in that way, but that doesn't mean to say that God doesn't have tremendous things to say and caution and transform in us through our experience of Scripture. And that means we have to be reading Bible more than just the five minutes that we do on Sunday morning. If you aren't reading your Bible during the week, that is a sign to you that you are needful of formation in how to experience Scripture. I think to myself, if you're a Roman Catholic, uh, you've got rosary, 
and you've got Stations of the Cross, and you've got Sacramental Adoration, and you've got Prayers with the Saints, and you have all, this, all these little spiritual disciplines that you can do. If you are a Protestant, like the centerpiece of our spirituality, the heart of our spiritual discipline is Bible reading. And if we aren't doing Bible reading, we pretty much have almost nothing else. So getting this congregation back into a posture of humility where we are experiencing Scripture every day is a high priority for this coming formation year. So we're going to use the second hour of programming on Sunday morning to do several things this year. And it's going to follow a pattern. First Sundays will involve food. Second Sundays will be formation. Third Sundays will be an opportunity to experience grouping. And fourth Sundays will be about servanthood. So the idea would be that if you could give us that one more hour, that you would become a more vibrant Christian over this coming program year. So first Sundays, food. And I am praying to baby Jesus that I can get 75% of you to show up for food. <laughs> so first Sundays of the month are going to be about food. Remember I taught a few weeks ago that one of Jesus' very most favorite things to do was to eat with people. One of Jesus' very most favorite things to do was to feed people. One of Jesus' very most favorite things to do was to talk about food as a symbol of God's kingdom to people and for people. So as we looked at last year, we thought, boy, we are missing out on an experience of communal gathering around food. We gather around sacramental food, but that should translate into gathering around real food. So in this coming year, over the course of those first Sundays, there will be quarterly potlucks. And the first one that will start will be on October 1st, when Bishop Hutterer comes to help us celebrate my 20th anniversary of ordained ministry. And we're just going to have a big old-fashioned family potluck uh, after that service. And I'm hoping that that won't feel like too great a sacrifice on your behalf to participate in the fun of that. Also on a quarterly basis, scheduled in those first Sundays, we're going to have continental breakfasts over at the fellowship hall. And while we're having our continental breakfast, we're going to be hearing from some missional celebrities on our territory. So on the first Sunday of November, we are going to have the church's leader, Solve Moose. Uh, that's a, not a technical churchy term. That's the name of an actual person. Solve Moose uh, helps to lead our synod's advocacy work for hunger. And since this is a congregation that has always seemed to care about feeding the hungry, it's time you learn about how the church is doing bigger work to combat the specter of hunger in our state. So they will be with us on November 5th. As a political moderate, I am always nervous about trying to find ways to unite you, my conservatives, and my progressives around things that can actually make a difference in the life of the world. And one place of connection that we seem to have discovered amongst you is our desire to stamp out the specter of trafficking, sex trafficking. And so we have Hannah, who is this great luminary and survivor of trafficking and leads the organization Streetlight, she will be coming to speak to us at one of these quarterly continental breakfasts 
to talk about how we work together to combat a culture of trafficking. And then, oh, go back one more, Matt. Uh, and then the last quarter, and I'm really excited about this one, uh, we have asked and have received acknowledgement from Patterson, who is the new executive director at the Navajo Evangelical Mission. And Patterson will be our celebrity, our mission celebrity in the spring quarter. And I think that the Holy Spirit is going to be lining something up so that at least peace, if not the Cactus Conference of Congregations, will be able to send a servanthood delegation, a friendship delegation, to the mission uh, this coming spring. So first Sundays are about food. There will still be some chances to learn things about the larger ministry of the church. Second Sundays are about formation. And that series is going to be called Being at Peace With. That's, again, Being at Peace, Lutheran Church, and Being at Peace in the Way of Jesus. And we're just going to focus on some very basic things that you need to learn and or remember about being a Jesus person. So it's going to start on the third Sunday of September, and we'll do Being at Peace with the Bible. And you need to learn how the Bible how God uses the Bible in our life together uh, so that you understand what's happening and you understand what you're being called to during the rest of the week in terms of your interaction with Scripture. So that means that I am asking you to think about attending nine monthly workshops over the coming program year so that you can bone up on the basics of what it means to be you as a follower of Jesus. Uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we heard the story when Elijah hears the still small voice uh, as he comes out of the cave, and God says, part of what is going to alleviate your stress is uh, you're going to go find a younger prophet to help you. And so God raises up Elisha, to be the successor of Elijah. Uh, I am flipping the script a little bit uh, as someone who is a little bit more like the Elisha character. I am reaching out to one of our favorite Elijahs to help me in the teaching ministry of the church. So I have asked Pastor Carl to share with me in teaching these nine monthly workshops, in part because it frees me up to do some other things, which I'll mention in a moment, but in part because I think you like Pastor Carl, and I desperately hope that you like him enough to have pity on him and show up for his class after the worship service. See, we're uh, wise as serpents and gentle as doves. We got to do whatever it takes to pull this off. Uh, what that does when Pastor Carl is sharing in the teaching ministries is it frees me up to participate in some of the Sunday morning education of our confirmands. Uh, last year, our confirmands were coming to a monthly pizza party followed by instruction. And those, I mean, you think about teenagers going to school all day and then eating a bunch of pizza, and then listening to the minister talk. They were so polite, really. And they were so pooped. And I realized the quality of formation was not happening, that I need to have happen for those young people. And so Lindsay will continue to get us wrangled and organized, uh, but what, what this format will do will allow me and Macon to participate in the formation experience for the confirmands on Sunday mornings. Next slide. Third Sundays are going to be an opportunity for grouping. 
Uh, really, these aren't true small groups. Small groups are supposed to be these groups of, I don't know, three to six people that are meeting at a time that is convenient to them off campus. I want to get us there, but we need an incubator for that kind of small group to become a reality at peace. So what will happen on third Sundays is going to be that incubator experience where we will have conversations in the long-standing tradition of Lutheran temple talks to connect our experience of worship and our experience of formation to our relationships with our fellow members of the congregation and to our own personal faith life, and it can help to build relationships. Fourth Sundays will be our servanthood component. This one seems to be the easiest one to recruit for. We always have way more than 10% of our worshiping attendants participating in packing rice and beans. That thing is, you know, I am proud of that little sweatshop I've got going on over there on Sunday morning, so we're not going to fiddle with it. And some great things happen in that time beyond uh, just packing rice and beans. Newcomers, one of the advantages of this is that instead of waiting, last year we had to wait almost the whole program year before we could have a newcomer component, and that was dedicated. Instead, we will be encouraging our newcomers to come to these workshops and these small groups at, whenever they're ready to plug in, and then at the end of every quarter of this coming program year, there will be an opportunity for those who are participating in newcomer experiences at the formation experiences to join the congregation. And you see council, God bless them, council has agreed to help host a newcomer's table at each of those formation opportunities. Some of you have said to me that it's been nice to see the young people in worship. You get to see Kaya uh, as an assisting minister. You get to see Sebastian helping to usher. You get to see Ryan helping to read readings. Uh, I just think it's the dumbest thing in the world to try to raise young people in the church, but you don't have them in the worship service. Like, if you don't raise them in the worship service, why the heck are they going to show up for worship when they're adult? They're going to think that it's all about going to the coffee time. So it hasn't been perfect. We haven't had 100% retention. But those that have stuck with us are seeing the fruit of having people plugged into worship life. We're going to try to do that same thing now with our third through fifth graders. Give them a reason to be in worship. And that means the return of altar service. Altar service, for those of you who may not be familiar with that technical churchy term, uh, is about having acolytes and crucifers participating in the worship service. Uh, then, all, oh, one more. Go back a little bit, Matt. On second Sundays, during the worship service, one thing that council noticed is that uh, godly play has been extremely popular with our kids, but we are seeing confirmation students, for us that's somewhere in the sixth to eighth grade range, showing up at, to confirmation and they don't yet know the sacraments of holy baptism and holy communion. Most of them know the Lord's Prayer Many of them don't know the Creed or the Ten Commandments, uh, and many of them don't have a strong experience of how to use a Bible. So as we try to imagine how we can help our young families to scratch those itches and get their third through fifth graders ready for confirmation in sixth through eighth grade, uh, we decided we would try this. On second Sundays of the month, Macon is going to abscond with our third grade through fifth grade students and are going to go over here to the youth room right next door so that they can receive coaching on memorizing those basic components of the faith that we summarize as being the small catechism uh, and 
coaching on how to actually do these things. So that includes basic interpretation. And again, following the philosophy of wise as serpents, gentle as doves, we will be finding creative ways to incentivize the third through fifth graders uh, to, to uh, do this memorization work. Then on third Sundays, you'll see the payoff. I'm also, I'll put this out there for you. So I have not run a midweek Bible study since I got here. And I'm interested in doing that. I'm interested in running a preacher's Bible study uh, probably on Thursdays as a lead in to the Sunday morning experience. And I would love to use this as a way of building some better, wider bridges to our friends in Westbrook Village. I'd love to be able to pitch it as, yes, this would be a Bible study with your friendly neighborhood Lutheran pastor, but also that it would be something that would help Roman Catholics and mainline Protestants prepare for Sunday morning worship wherever they go because we all listen to the same scripture readings. I don't have the details quite nailed down, so if you are someone from Westbrook Village or you are someone who might be interested in participating in that kind of Bible experience with me on Thursday, probably Thursday mornings, would you reach out to me and let me know uh, if you have opinions? Uh, I know you have opinions, but uh, uh, if you have opinions, that might be helpful to me in building a plan. So how can you help? I've shared with you over these last few weeks, what we have here at Peace is very precious, and it's worth working for. It's worth fighting for. So part of our work together means showing up, showing up for worship, showing up for the formation experiences that your congregation offers. Also means reaching out and inviting people to participate in those experiences. And if you are still at a point, and we just need to talk turkey here, if you're still at a point where you're not proud enough of your congregation that you are not willing to invite someone who needs what we have to experience that gift here at Peace, then you need to tell me, because uh, I want you to be proud of your congregation, proud enough to extend the invitation. And we're going to do what it takes to get you to a place of confidence that you're doing what Jesus called you to do, to invite people to be a part of it. You remember all the talk about food? I could really use help coordinating those experiences of eating together. So if that sounds like something up your alley, uh, then I could use that help. And then uh, I know Debbie Bear has uh, Debbie Bear has been incredible. Debbie helped me to uh, do some of the recruiting for our mission celebrities at our quarterly continental breakfasts. Uh, and she also found a great grouping resource for us that is based on the Sunday morning readings. Uh, but for that to be successful, that grouping experience on third Sundays, it really would be awesome if we had some folks who were willing to be facilitators of that table talk. Uh, and that might require a little bit of prep, but not a huge amount of prep. So if that's something you might be interested in helping to do, I could really use the help there. Uh, and finally, uh, ultimately, this is not about institutional survival. Uh, I am not one of the defeatist clergy in the Evangelical Lutheran Church who says the church is just going to die, the last one out, just turn off the lights. That, to me, it has been so discouraging and so foreign to the way God wired me, and I refuse to function that way 
for however long I get to be the pastor of Peace Lutheran Church. Uh, we are still making the wager that by coming into this community, Jesus does something in people's hearts and their minds and their lives. Jesus does something that he would not do in them if they weren't participating in congregational life. These things are transformative for you and for our neighbors. Ultimately, being at peace isn't just about being at peace at Peace Lutheran Church. It's about finding your center in the timeless life of Jesus and being able to get up every morning and face the rigors, the joys, and challenges of every day, trusting that even though it may not be easy, you've got the one with holes in his hands holding your hand tightly through it all. That's what being at peace should mean for you, for this congregation, and it sure should mean that for our neighbors. Whew. Amen. Let's stand.